Amen, amen, amen. Man, God is good, isn't he? Okay. How many enjoyed last Sunday of Knock Knock? We're just getting practical. So I told, uh, told uh, some people, I said, I'm going to get rid of the uh, podium for a while. I'm going to sit at a table. I want to get practical. And I just want to do a teaching so we understand exactly what it is that we're going through and the enemy that we face. So this is practical teaching. So it may be a little bit more uh, different than the, than the preaching that I've done. And so, but I hope that you enjoy it as we just learn something. I think anytime you can dive into the Word of God and look at something a little different, maybe from a different angle, um, I really believe the Holy Spirit will speak to you. I want to encourage anybody that can, midweek here at FWC has been powerful. We've seen some God do some great things. Uh, if you feel like you're having a hard time making connections and want to meet people, I want to encourage you to come on a Wednesday night what we're doing in the fellowship hall, what our kids are doing. Megan and Nathan are doing such an incredible job with our youth. I uh, love to see the fruit smash. And, uh, and uh, that was pretty ripe out there. But I love the fruit smash. I love seeing the kids show up. Had a, I think we had a record group Wednesday night. Tabitha does an incredible job with the kids. Jessica, our nursery worker, uh, she has transformed that nursery. We've got some incredible things going, some great ministries, and I want to encourage you to be a part of that. I am talking about big church on Wednesday nights, and we're going all the way back to how the church began and what the true function of it was supposed to be, so I think that you'll enjoy that. Well, we're in week two of Knock Knock. So, told you last week, I told a joke that just dropped like a lead balloon. So I, I looked around, asked around, and I found another bad joke. Okay? So let's see how this one goes. Are you ready? Knock, knock. Banana. Banana. Knock, knock. Banana. Banana. Knock, knock. Orange. Orange. Aren't you glad I didn't say Banana. It just gets worse, doesn't it? Okay, if you think you got a better one, let me know and I'll, I'll present it next. Creasa, stop. Just stop. Creasa's going, stop while you're ahead. Don't bring another knock-knock joke, whatever you do. Hey, as we're looking at this thing, there's always someone, or there's always something knocking at the front door of our life trying to get in. And sometimes when we answer the door, there's a favor and a blessing that may come. And it could be a good thing that is on the other side of that knock. But there are other times that there is something knocking at the front door of our life. That if we open that door, it does nothing but bring a devastation into our life. And what's so interesting is sometimes that knock and that presentation we open the door not ever really realizing that it is the enemy that is bringing something into our life. Sometimes it is disguised by something that we want or something that we desire. So as I go through this, we're going to identify who the enemy is. What is his strategy? What does he want? Where did he come from? And where is he going? And so we're kind of looking at this whole thing as we go through kind of discussing this. Now, last week I threw this up, and this was a saying by C.S. Lewis, and I just love what it says. It says that there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every, every square inch and every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. There is an enemy that is coming at us. It's not an if, it's not a when. The attack is already taking place. And the enemy is coming at us. And any time the enemy can get his foot in the doorway of our life to get, to get it opened, any time he sees God blasting, the enemy is going to come blasting in our life. You see, the Bible describes him as many different things, and we're going to be looking at three of these as we just study this through this series. But the Bible describes Lucifer, the devil, Satan, whatever you want to call him, describes him as a deceiver who attacks your mind with lies. It describes him 
as the accuser who attacks your heart with, with accusations. And the destroyer who attacks you with pride. He'll attack your will with pride. So today we're going to continue talking about the deceiver and and how the deceiver came into being and, and I'll, I'm going to recap just a little bit so if you didn't if you weren't here you'll need to go back online and and watch this you can get on your Bible app or whatever you need to do but today we're going to continue talking about this and we're going to talk about in the beginning what the devil's name was and it was Lucifer he was an archangel he was one of one of God's pride and joy the, the Bible tells us that he was beautiful Basically, above and beyond description. He was the most beautiful thing that God had created. And in His beauty, His wings, literally the archangel, His wings, His, his job was to cover the glory of God with His worship. He was the protector of worship in all of heaven. He was created beautiful. He was literally created powerful. There was a magnetic, charismatic type of a, something draw in his personality. And, and he was just beautiful. But something was birthed within him and it started with a thing called pride. He looked at God and he basically said, I want the worship that you get. I want people to bow down to me. I want people to worship me. And as you read the scripture that we looked at last week, and I'm not going to go there today, but basically this is what Satan said over and over and over. I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. And in the middle of wanting so much, sin was birthed inside of him. And the Bible now describes him as the father of all lies. And when he speaks, he only speaks his native language. How can anything so beautiful end up so ugly? It's called sin. And what happened to Lucifer from the very beginning of time of that sin that was introduced in his life, if we're not careful, that same sin brings the same ugliness into each and every one of our lives. You see, his name was changed. His name was associated with light. He was the light that, that shone the glory of worship over God. His name literally meant, meant brightness or, or son of the morning dawn. It meant light. I told everybody if we'd have been there with him, we'd have probably called him Sonny. Hey, Sonny, what's up? But sin introduced into his life and his name literally was changed from light to darkness. And I meet people all the time that they come and talk to me and they talk to me and they say, why is my life so devastated? Why does everything in my life seem so dark? Why does things in my life seem so clouded? Why do I feel I've got, that, I've got this pressure in my chest all the time of just an empty ache all the time? And I have to sit down and I have to talk to him about the results of sin because sin will change us from the inside out. Sin changed Lucifer and sin will change us. It separated him from God and it separated him from righteousness and sin does the exact same thing to us. It separates us from the very presence of God and it separates us from righteousness and right living. So as we start this second part of Knock Knock, I want you to understand how incredibly important it is that we understand this spiritual journey that we're in. But not just that, that we understand this spiritual battle that we face every day that we get out of bed and every day that we put our feet on the floor and every day that we try to do anything. Again, I'm going to say this, the greatest trick that the devil ever pulled was trying to convince people that he does not exist. And I add to that, I think the greatest trick that the enemy tried to ever pull was trying to, to, to conceive the ideal to people that God's laws are not real. That really, they don't need to be obeyed. Just observed but not really obeyed, and that there is no consequence at all 
to our actions. So I think what the enemy wants you to believe is he wants you to go overboard on steroids with the belief that grace covers everything. Now, if you want to split a church, preach on grace. If you want to split a church, preach on tithing. But I think too many people lean on a crutch of grace that they say, oh, I know who Jesus is because I can sin and I can do everything that I want to do and every sin that I'll ever commit is covered. Well, if you got a problem with what I'm saying, come talk to me after church. We'll sit down and we'll talk about it. But I believe there is a place where you can divorce yourself from the presence of God and you can walk out of a relationship and you can rebel. And the Word of God tells us that there is a test and it's called the fruit of the Spirit. Because if things are not being produced out of you that glorify and reflect the presence of God, you might want to question your walk. Because I think we can get to a place where the enemy laughs at our ignorance to the Word of God. Because we have convinced ourselves we're okay. Me and God are best buds. Slap him on the back and say, Hey God, how you doing? I don't think I'll ever slap God on the back and ask him how he's doing. Because I probably in his presence will fall on my face in awe of the glory that radiates from him. But we don't fear God. Why? Because the enemy is very good at the battle that he does. I read a couple of things on Facebook that I just wanted to throw out at you because I thought these things were awesome. And so I went ahead and wrote them down. So here's the first. If you get mad at me, get mad at Facebook because I, I got it from Facebook, okay? The devil doesn't care if you go to church or read your Bible as long as you don't apply it to your life. Isn't that amazing? How about this one? There was a time when people went to church and wept over their sins. Today, people go to church, hear a motivational speech, and ignore their sins. The greatest trick the enemy has ever pulled off on this world was convincing this world that he really doesn't exist. You see, sin changes things. It changes things. And if you go back and really look at Lucifer, and how it changed him from something so incredibly beautiful to something so hideous. It is the picture of what takes place when we openly allow sin to take place in our life. You see, sin will take every one of your desires. Sin will take every one of your wants. Sin will take all of your wishes and every hope that you have in your life. And sin will dress it up into something that seems so right in your head and so right in your heart. And sin will cause you to look at every bad choice and every bad decision that you make in your life and say things like this, Oh, I'm okay. It's okay. It's not going to hurt anybody. I can just do it for a little while and then I can quit. Once, twice, three times, four. It's okay. I'm all right. But what sin does is it masquerades itself as right living. Sin masquerades itself in such a place that you justify everything that you do not according to the Word of God, but according to every one of your desires, wants, wishes, and hopes. And it masquerades itself as right living when in reality it does nothing but it opens the door for wrong living that ushers in a very presence of something that if we're not careful can turn us into absolutely something horribly disgusting. So here's what sin does. Sin changes people. What it does is it turns us into good old boys. Just good old boys. 
We can go out and do anything and have a good old time because we're just good old boys. And sin turns us into good old boys that people love to go party with instead of good old Christian followers who's making an absolute difference in building the kingdom of God. You see, sin changes our marriages and sin changes our relationships. Sin, when introduced into a marriage relationship, brings ruin. Sin, when entered into relationships with friends or relationships that we try to have outside of the bounds of the marriage bond that God set up, sin introduces something into each and every one of our lives that is devastating. Sin changes people. Sin changes things. Sin changes the way we look at things. And sin changes relationships. But not only does sin change relationships that people have within, in the marriage and, and things that people have in relationship, sin changes church. Ponder that thought for just a moment. Sin will change the atmosphere of the church that you sit in. Sin will change the direction and the velocity that this ministry needs to go in. Indifference to Scripture and the only pleasing me does not only affect you when you come to church. It affects everyone that is around you. You see, over the years, what we have seen is there is way too much of the beliefs of the world that has now filtered into the church. And the church is starting to act like the world. Instead of too much of the church filtering into the world and the world becoming what the church is. But what we've noticed over the years is there has been a subtle, subtle, subtle change that has taken place in the hearts and the minds of people that come to church. Now I want to pause and I want to say exactly what I said Wednesday night so you understand. I love church. I am a churchaholic. If I see any construction going on at any church in town, this boy is snooping and checking it out. If there's a weekend service going on, I'm usually telling my wife, are you okay doing whatever you do? Well, I sneak off and go see what's happening. I am a church dog. I love the church. I believe in the church. And the church does an incredible job. So can I, can I put that in there before I slam it? Is that okay? Not slamming it. We're, we're just going to get real, okay? There's been a subtle change that has been introduced in the church. And this is how we know. The things that would have been considered as ungodly, immoral, and appalling a few years back are so widely accepted by so many people in our church today. And not just accepted, practiced openly without any shame or repentance. And what really bothers me, bothers me is this. And liked on Facebook by everybody. What's up with that? Open, blatant, sit, and I'm going to lock it. I'm gonna, 366 locks. And I go, really? What's happened to our morals? What's happened to our values? What's happening to the things that, that we should be attaching ourselves to? Romans 6.23 says this, For the wages of sin is death. What is a wage? A wage is something that you earn because of something that you do. You do a service and you're paid a wage. And the Bible wants us to know that when you work hard for sin and when you earn the sin by the ungodly living that you do, the Bible says for the wages, the payment that's going to be given to you because of the sin that you do, that you attach yourself to, the payment given to you is death. And when you really dissect that and look at it in all different aspects through the Word of God, it is a physical, a mental, a spiritual, and a relational death 
that comes into your life. So we think sin doesn't affect us, and sometimes we sin and we think we get, along, uh, get by with it. But there is a thing that we need to be very careful about that is called a generational curse and a generational sin that you think you may be okay. But what your kids and what your friends watch you do in moderation, they will probably do in excess. And the generational curse is set because of a standard that you cannot set in your life of godliness. So the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. Well, that's depressing, isn't it? But. Don't you get excited about the big butts of the Bible? But. I think every time I read that but, I go, whoo-hoo! Yeah! There's a but! God's got something incredible right now. But. But he gives us a way out. But he gives us hope. But he said, sin is not what defines your character. It does not have to define who you are. I loved you so much, I sent my son to down a cross that you can have life and that you can have everlasting life. Huh. That you can have an abundant life. Oh, let me go further. That you can have eternal life. This is how much I love you. But the gift of God, who's God? <laughs> the giver of life, the giver of all. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ our Lord. See, when I look at the reality, I don't want to be a good old boy and just cruise through life and have fun. I want to be a good old follower. That's what I want to be. That's understanding the Word of God. That is taking the Word of God and dissecting it, turning turn it apart, and putting it internally in my life that I'm living out the Word of God. Because I want to be an example. I want to be a hope. I want to let people see Jesus in me, even though I'm not perfect, but I want to let them see Jesus in me. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You see, this is what I think the enemy would love to do to us in the church. I think the enemy would love to very quietly, very subtly enter into our lives individually and, and get us to places where we just do things without thinking about what the long-term effect is going to be. We just do things. We just kind of gloss over it. Kind of ignore it, hoping it'll go away. Kind of turned a blind eye like we don't see it. And I think what the enemy wants to do is he wants just to come in so very quietly and subtly and create an indifference in our life that goes to the friends that you hang with that the indifference begins to take place at settings and parties and different things, that you'll lay down your guard here and you'll start to do things together that you should never do. Then you'll do things in front of your kids. You'll say words that you should never say. You'll allow things into your house that should never be allowed into your house. And little by little, it filters into the church. And the church becomes like the world. And it's what the enemy wants. You know, it's like the illustration of the frog in the pot of water. Anybody heard that illustration? You can take a pot of water and put a frog in there and always oh, just have a heyday. You can take that same pot of water and you can put it on the stove and you can heat that thing up to boiling and throw that frog in and as soon as you throw him in, what does he do? Yeah! It's probably exactly what he does. And he jumps out. But you can take that same frog in that same pot of water and you can put him on the stove and put him in that water and turn the heat up and slowly and surely let the heat rise in that pot. And that frog will swim around or land in water until he allows himself to boil to death and die. Because he can't detect the subtle change that has taken place. And that's 
what the enemy wants to do in our life. The great deceiver is trying to turn up the heat of immorality in the church and in each individual life. And he's turning it up so subtle that we answer the call to be good old boys and to go out with the crowd and do anything that we want to do and we justify it. How do we justify it? By literally throwing the Word of God as far away from us as we can get. And then we justify it by trying to, well, I think that's what it says. We don't apply it. We've heard it taught. So the Word of God is so distant from our life that we become ignorant to the reality of God's Word. You see, if we don't keep this thing close to us, if we don't read this for what it is, if we don't look at its instructions, if we do not ever dive into this thing, how in the world are we ever going to understand the attack when it comes? Because we'll be blindsided and think that it is right living when it is wrong. You see, you can go to church all day long. You can pay your tithe all the time. You can worship, you can serve, and you can give and still not be right with God. You can be right with yourself in the ignorance of your mind, but not right with God. Because righteousness is nothing more than right living. Just right living. That's what it is. How do we live right? Not according to the standards of this world not according to what everybody else wants to do. Oh, but I'll pay so you can have fun. Well, that sounds good because I don't have to pay for it. But what does it do? It leads you in the wrong direction. The real question is, what is the testimony that comes out of your good old boy experience? What is the testimony? Is it leading people to the cross truly? Or is it leading people away from the cross? Because you can go to church all day long, but until there is true repentance, real repentance, a repentance that brings change. I'm sorry, and I'm talking real change. Change where you change things. That kind of change. Okay? Not just a word. You change things. It is a change that comes through a right relationship with Jesus, not a right relationship with your church, not a right relationship with this thing called religion, where you just show up, go through the motions and the rituals and go home. It is a right relationship with God that you begin to look at the things of your life and it brings a change because sin disgusts you. The attack of the enemy makes you righteously angry. The enemy trying to take your kids out from under you? <laughs> oh, no, 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 you did not, devil. You want to mess with a bear? You mess with a mama bear. Don't mess with my kids. It is a change that says, I change the way I think. I change the way I perceive things. I change the way I look at the places that I'm going and the things that I'm doing. I change the way my influence is impacting people. Am I becoming repelling to the things of God? Or is my, is my personality like magnetic drawing people into the presence of God? Man, if you hang with them out there, why are they not hanging with you here? The reason is, is because your magnet is turned the wrong direction and you're repelling people from the very presence of God. You have fallen into something. We have fallen into something where the enemy is so subtly introducing us to sin and we don't even recognize it for what it is. So how does the deceiver work? What does he do? Well, he'll do anything he can to get you to focus on people to focus on things, to focus on situations. He even loves for you to focus on religion. 
Because you know, the enemy knows that religion never saved anybody. You're only saved by the grace of God. And you're only redeemed by the precious name of Jesus Christ. And he knows that if he can get you to take your eyes off of other things and to focus on your wants and your desires, your hopes and your dreams, without applying it to the word of God, without claiming it in the name of Jesus, with all the power and the authority as a child of God that has been given to you. He knows that if he can get you to focus on the good old boy and having fun, that he can subtly introduce you to something that will take your focus off of Jesus and lead you in the wrong direction. You see, I, I think the enemy lacks religion. Lucifer, he understands religion. Remember what he was in charge of? He was the worship pastor in heaven. He understands. He knows what this thing is all about. But he was kicked out. Now he's ticked off and he just wants to take somebody down with him. You know what I mean? So I think the enemy lacks religion. And here's why I think that. I'm going to give you nine reasons, okay? Religion sees people as the enemy. Jesus sees sin as the enemy. See what I'm saying? Religion says showing grace is dangerous. Jesus says, tell me about it. I know. <laughs> Some of you will get that on the way home. Number three, religion grades righteousness on a curve. Jesus grades righteousness on a cross. Religion makes God the boss and you the employee. Jesus makes God the father and you the son. Is that good? Religion says only listen to, attend, and watch Christian things. Jesus says look for truth everywhere. Religion is fueled by fear and punishment. Jesus is fueled by love and mercy. Religion is safe and practical. Jesus is radical and unpredictable. Amen. Religion says, if you follow God, He will bless your life. Jesus says, if you follow God, He will give you life. And number nine, Jesus says, come to church and serve. Jesus says, go into the world and serve. You see how the enemy takes everything and twists it? So what we've got to understand, there is a battle going on around us every single day. And Ephesians 6.12, it defines this battle that we looked at last week. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But we make it about that. That's why churches split. Because they don't get mad at an enemy that subtly comes in and causes strife within the body of Christ. He works on each individual's heart and mind subtly to introduce something in such a way that they build such an offense that they don't hold it in. But what do people do when they're offended? I'm going to talk and take somebody out with me. Sin never affects one person. You never sin alone but it always affects other people. And too many times, it affects groups of people. That's why churches split. That's why marriages go through divorces. That's why kids run off and leave families because the enemy is very good at what he does. We turn our battle into each other and we fight each other and we try to take each other down or we try to take each other out for the count. And God says, you're looking at this thing from a worldly point of view. Your battle is not against the person that you're mad at. Your battle is against an enemy who has subtly entered into your life in some way, form, or fashion. And he may have entered in 10 or 15 years down the road that direction. And it may just now be coming to a head. But your battle's not here. Your battle is against an enemy who is real. 
an enemy who is really pretty powerful, but not as powerful as our God, not near as powerful as the authority that you have in the name of Jesus, but he does have power to influence, and he wins so often, and, our, and we make our battle against flesh and blood, against people, against things. He said, no, this is your battle. Your battle is against rulers of this dark age. There is, a, there is a satanic army that has been put together to take all of us out for the count. And the Word of God says there are rulers that are in charge of certain things that are trying to tear you down. There are authorities that have been put in place almost as safeguards to try to usher out the very presence of God instead of letting in the presence of God. And they are encamped around churches, around White Houses, around government buildings. They are encamped around schools. They are encamped to make sure the glory of God, God doesn't come in. And if we don't know how to fight this battle properly, we lose. We lose. Because sin is powerful, sin is ugly. Don't be deceived so easily by the snare that tries to entrap you and take you down. And it's not just rulers and authorities. There's powers of this dark world against spiritual forces of evil. There is a demonic war that has taken place constantly, not just around us, but I think it's taking place in our head of an enemy that does nothing but whisper lies into our head all day long. And against special forces that's in the heavenly realm. Why does Satan want to take you out so bad? Have you ever thought about that? This is why. The angels are created beings. Beautiful created beings. But when he got to us, he did something different. And it said that he created us in his very image. You were created in the image of God. How much more does he want to destroy what God created in his image if he can't destroy God, yeah, that's good. which he never will? That's good. That's good. He will go after God's creation that was created in his image to try to destroy you. It is never if he attacks. We've got to understand the attack is taking place right now. Last week we talked about how he introduced sin and he deceived Eve with a question. Did God really say? See what we've got to understand is, man, he is slick. The enemy is sly. He camouflaged himself to Adam and Eve and sold himself as something that he was not. And he got them to buy into the lie because that's all he can do. He got them to buy into the lie. And because of the lie, sin was introduced into their life. And what's amazing as we look at this, and this, this, this entity, this, this Lucifer, this devil, this Satan, this destroyer, this deceiver, we look at him and he was so good at what he does. Don't think for a minute that on your own you can resist sin. Don't, don't think you can for a minute because he took one third of heaven with him in a battle. He's powerful. He's very good at what he does. We've got to understand that sin is an ugly monster. Sin is like a cancerous disease that it never affects one person, but it spreads like a fungus. It spreads like a wildfire that is completely out of control and sin will destroy everything that it will come in contact with except for the righteousness of God. Is this okay? Yeah. Are we getting it? Is it, good to, is it good to dive into this and just understand? So what is his strategy? His strategy from the very beginning, he did it with Eve, he did it with Adam, he's done it all the way down through, through history. His strategy is to get you to question God. He never questioned that God spoke. He just said, did God really say a question? And I think that's where we find ourselves in trouble all the time. Because I constantly have people come to me saying, is it wrong to do such and such? Well, why are you asking? Really, I mean, think, think about the question that you're asking. If you have to ask if it's wrong, it's probably wrong. 
Mom, can I stay out till 2.30 in the morning with a bunch of boys? Well, honey, no. You know, I mean, why, why did you have to, you knew, you knew what the answer was, you knew it was wrong. Your mom was looking at you going, well, what are you, an idiot? I raised you better than that. You know, if you have to ask, it's probably wrong. He wants us not only to question God, he wants us to question the things of God. He wants to, us to question morals. He wants us to question values. He wants us to question biblical principles that only lead us into righteousness. So, he's very good. I'm going to take about 10 minutes and I'm going to bring this thing to a close, okay? But as I'm starting to bring this thing to a close, God gave us 10 laws. They're called the 10 commandments, not the 10 suggestions. But they're the 10 commandments. They are the law of righteousness that leads us into a right relationship. Right is right living. That's all that righteousness is right living according to the word of God. Okay, right living. So he gave us these 10 commandments. But man, I tell you, the enemy is so good at what he does to deceive people. That now the Ten Commandments doesn't apply because they're Old Testament and we're a New Testament church. So I really don't have to live by the Old Testament. All I've got to do is live by the principles laid out in the New Testament. Okay, if you're going to live by the principles laid out in the New Testament, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, I didn't come to demolish the law or to do away with the law. I came to fulfill the law that was already put in place. My purpose is to bring fulfillment to the entire Word of God. Ten principles that will guide your life into righteousness. But too many people in the world don't have a clue what the Ten Commandments is. Oh, I've heard the words, but I don't know what they are. So let's look. Let's look at the Ten Commandments. Let's look at the law that the enemy wants us to be ignorant of and see what guides us into right living. Law number one, you shall have no other gods before me. The first commandment is about loyalty. It's about loyalty. The creator of the universe declared that he and he alone is God and he deserves all of the praise. And he requires us to demonstrate our love for him by having no other gods called football or baseball or addictions or whatever it may be. You shall have no other gods before me. The first commandment is the first of a series of four commandments that defines our relationship with the Heavenly Father. So you want to get in alignment with God? There's four things listed right up front in the Ten Commandments that we have to get in order. If we're going to get, if we're going to get anything right with God, we have to get this right. And so he lays four things out that establishes a relationship with our Heavenly Father. This first one on loyalty is about establishing developing and maintaining a personal relationship with the one and true living God. I'll have no other gods before you. Number two, and, and this is in short form, okay? You shall not make idols of anything. The second commandment has to do with our worship. It's all about our worship. It is about worshiping the one and only true God who loved us so much that He gave us everything that we can have everything, but He is jealous of our love. He doesn't want it shared. Good example? Shannon's not going to share me with nobody, no time at any time. And if, she try, if you try to share me with her, she's going to kill you and me, and she's going to start a prison ministry. <laughs> know what I'm saying? 
She's jealous of my love and I'm jealous of her love. We are married. This ring signed, sealed, and delivered. When you accept Jesus Christ in your life and you are baptized with Him, death, burial, and resurrection, you wear the wedding ring of a relationship with Jesus Christ and you say this, I worship you, you alone, you are my God, and I have no other idols but you. Amen? The third one, you shall not take the Lord your God's name in vain. Shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The third commandment is all wrapped up in our reverence. It teaches us something. As I honor God, I develop something within me that filters honor to other people. I know David Morgan could amen to this and other people that's been in the military could probably amen to this and I've learned this through listening to Cameron now that he's Marine. But from the second you put on those boots and hit that floor, you are taught to honor, 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 honor. You honor your brothers you honor your flag. You honor your nation. You honor everything that you put your, your foot to. They are trained to honor, 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 honor. And this commandment, don't take the Lord God's name in, name in vain at all. It's about reverence and it's about birthing something in you of honor. God asks us to respect His holy name and not to use it in vain. The third commandment, focuses on showing total and complete respect. Respect is something that is handed down. When we respect God for who He is, we will respect and respect and respect. The fourth one is this. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. The fourth commandment is about sanctification and relationship. And it, it's funny that God only starts this one off with this word, remember, remember. Because God knew that in our schedule, we would forget to pause and regenerate. He knew that in our busy schedules, we would get so caught up with things that we wouldn't remember to stop and give Him praise. That we wouldn't remember to stop and to, and to just give God, this is your day. And He wants us on this day to come to a place of sanctification and a place of relationship. It is a place that He says, I want you to remember. I want you to set something apart that is holy in this process of what you're going through so that in this day, in this moment, in this Sabbath, in this time of resting, you can draw back near to me. The fifth one is this. Honor your father and your mother. This is about respect for parental authority. You see, God instructs us to show love to our parents by honoring them. I figured a mom or a dad would say amen to that. God instructs us to show His love to our parents by honoring them. The fifth commandment introduces us to a new series of commandments that defines our relationship with people. The fifth through the tenth serve as a standard of conduct in areas of human behavior that affects individuals, it affects families, it affects groups, and it affects societies. Families are the building blocks of society and families are the building blocks of strong nations. When families are fractured and flawed, the sad results are tragic and we read about them in the newspaper and see them on TV all the time. It has been said, so goes the family, so goes the nation. So this is a guideline set up that introduces us how to honor and have respect for those in authority. This is what the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians uh, 6, 2 and 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. 
honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on this earth. Now, some people interpret that scripture wrong because they interpret it like, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. <laughs> but that's not exactly what it's about. God wants to honor us as we honor Him and as we honor those who are over us. Number six, shall not commit murder. The sixth commandment is about respect for human life. Man, I could get off on a soapbox on this one. Because there is a human life that is taken out every second in this world. And it is legal. And the enemy has done a very fine job at distorting that issue. See, God is, it demonstrates for us to love others. To love people in such a way that we keep everything under control. How do you not kill somebody? Get a handle on your temper. <laughs> you know what I mean? See, the sixth commandment reminds us that God is the giver of life, and He alone has the authority to take it or grant it however He wants to do it. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. The seventh commandment is about purity in relationships. You see, God, He asks us to demonstrate and express our love for each other in this sanctity called marriage. And outside of the marriage guidelines, the biblical guidelines, this, this commandment that talks about purity in relationships God's law, it, sanctions, it, it sanctions sexual relationships only within legitimate marriages. The command not to commit adultery covers in many different principles and very many varieties of sexual immorality. And basically, it's all boiled down. No sexual relationships of any sort should occur outside of of the marriage vow. When you violate God's law of right living between a man and a woman, you do nothing but set up a series of events to violate a right living between God and man. Number eight, shall not steal. The eighth commandment is about honesty. God instructs us to show our love and respect for others by not stealing what belongs to them. The Eighth Commandment, it safeguards everyone's right to legitimately acquire and own property. God wants us to have things. God wants us to prosper, but God doesn't want us to covet things. God doesn't want us to steal things and to take things. Number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. The Ninth Commandment is about what? trustfulness. God says, if we love others, we're not going to deceive them or lie about them. In other words, watch how you talk that it don't turn into slander. Watch how you talk that it does not turn into gossip. Watch how you talk that you don't end up lying about people and getting to the place where you believe the lie as the absolute truth. Thou shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Number 10, thou shalt not covet. The 10th commandment, the, uh, the commandment is all about contentment. Being very content with what you have today. To covet means to crave or to desire in excess or in improper ways. So watch that you don't become greedy and that you don't want what you don't have. That's the Ten Commandments. That's what it's all about. So what the enemy does is the enemy wants to subtly come in and he wants to steal. He wants to kill and he wants to destroy. But what he wants to do is he wants to come into a water life that we don't know that he's there. He sneaks in. Has anybody 
Ever been laying in bed in the middle of the night, your kids are asleep in the other bedroom, and all of a sudden you hear a crash? Or you hear somebody at the door? There's been people that I've talked to that said, we ran our house and somebody broke in to come steal what we've got, to come do harm. To come. You, you never know what the enemy is going to come in to do when they come in. This is all I know. I'm not built like Sylvester Stallone or Arnold. But I'm going to guarantee you something. You break into my house and you try to steal my stuff or harm my wife or take my kids, I'm going to morph into a Jackie Chan, <laughs> Jason Bourne, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Rocky Balboa. I'm going to morph into something that is going to attack you and take you out. But we've got too many people that when the enemy attacks, they morph into this coward that just lets the enemy come in and take, steal, and destroy. How do we do this thing? Put up Ephesians for me. How do we do this? God never puts us in a battle. God never puts us in a situation without having a way out. So God says this, in this battle, not if, in this battle, the one that you woke up in this morning, the one that you had with your spouse on the way to church. In this battle, this is what he says. Finally, be strong in the Lord because you can't do it on your own. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. He says, put on. You've got to do this action. This is what you have to do physically every day. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of darkness dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. He says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand, what does it say? Stand firm. How do we do that? It is by taking the belt of truth and buckling it around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take the helmet or the shield of faith which can extinguish all the fiery flames of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation. It's right thinking through the word of God, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. How do we do this thing? Put on our armor. We trust God. We stop being deceived and we go to battle. Amen.